All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. been talking about the identifying marks of the New Testament church. Basic, fundamental, and yet vital. Important that I understand the identity of the church purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. But someone says, preacher, there's a great deal of, of repetition there. Oh, that's true. There's no question. Paul said for me to write the same things to you, indeed to me, is not irksome. But for you, it is needful. You see, I need to read the book every day. Oh yes, I need to reread the book. Yes, I need to read it every day, over and over and over. You know when you really stop to think about it. Uh, Jesus talks about uh, eating my flesh, drinking my blood, does he not? Uh, you remember John chapter 6, I am the bread that came down out of heaven, of which a man may eat and live forever. Or oh, the bread which I give is my flesh for the life of the world. Verse 51, what did you say, Lord, in John 6, 51? I'm the bread of life. What am I to do but eat it? Now, this is figurative language, of course. He gave his life on the cross, his body, eh, to redeem my soul. Now, I am to ingest all of the information made available through his death and subsequent resurrection. You see, that's called the New Testament. Where a testament is, there must of necessity be the death of him that made it. For a testament is a force where there hath been death, for it doth never avail while he that made it liveth. Hebrews 9, 16 and 17. So when Christ died, he validated his covenant. Now, does it change every time I read it? It doesn't change at all. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today, yea, and forever. Hebrews 13 at verse 8. So then it is repetitious to some extent, and yet most people miss the point. They simply pay little or no attention to the Lord's instruction. So then Jesus said in verse 54 of John chapter 6, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. And somebody claims, you know, and may be a little bit agitated by uh, the repetition. I've heard that before. Have you listened? Uh, what was it Jesus said to those Pharisees, John chapter 8, verse 43? Uh, why is it that you cannot uh, understand my speech? Oh, even because you cannot hear my words. Uh, Lord, these people are not deaf. No, uh, they hear audibly everything you say. Right. The point is they're not listening with their hearts. People simply listen with the outer ear, and they say, yeah, I've heard that before. Wait, 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 have you? Have you listened with your heart? Have you paid attention to what the circumstances of life really are? There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, and in just a very short time, you and I will be in one or the other. Now, there's only one way that I can go to heaven, that I can stand in a right relationship with God, and that's by faith. Uh, faith makes itself manifest in obeying uh, this blood-sealed covenant, giving my life to the Lord. Oh, yes, it is somewhat repetitious, but that is to impress the importance of truth, which makes men free, John 8, verse 32, upon my heart. And really, when you stop to think about it in a practical way, maybe you eat fried chicken. Someone said, yeah, I ate it one time in my life. Uh, possibly you eat uh, a biscuit. Uh, oh, yeah, I ate one biscuit one time in my life. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Eat fried chicken over and over. Uh, biscuits uh, time and time again. Uh, you see, you ingest physical food for the maintenance of the physical strength of this old earthly body. Right. Same thing. This is spiritual food for the maintenance of your faith in Jesus Christ. So we've been talking about the identifying marks of the 
church about which you read in the New Testament. <clears throat> There's only one, by the way, Ephesians 4 at verse 5. Of course, we are familiar with that. Uh, none others are mentioned except by way of denunciation. You see, we're all to speak the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at verse 10. We're to be of the same mind and of the same judgment. Well, now someone says, preacher, that's just not Paul. Oh, yes. You see, when we speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4 verse 11, when we preach only the Word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5. Oh, then we believe, we obey, we teach the same thing. Why, certainly. Then we are united. Uh, no question about that. But now with the manual and the discipline and the catechism and the confession of faith and the Book of Mormon and the Koran and so on and on and on. Uh, no, no, that's uh, divisive. That is uh, different. Uh, that creates division uh, in the religious world. Well, now somebody says, preacher, there's division in the Church of Christ. Why, well, certainly. Certainly. As a matter of fact, uh, all of the division condemned and corrected in the New Testament was in the Lord's Church because there weren't any others till about the 16th century. No, no. All of it. Yeah, wherever you have people, you're going to have problems. That's what Christianity is all about, is working through one problem after another. And that's why the Lord, in that uh, parable of the sower, you remember Luke chapter 8, uh, talked about the seed that uh, fell on the rocky ground. <clears throat> sprang up, all oh, that old rock warmed up, and that little plant came out, but then when that rock really heated up, the little plant withered and died, had no uh, moisture. What is he saying when he explained that? People who obey the first principles of the gospel with an idea that the church is perfect, that everybody in it, there's no problem, that hey, 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 wherever you have people, you have differences. Wherever you have people, you have problems. Oh, and the New Testament gives instruction for dealing with that kind of thing within the framework of the redeemed, uh, the church. Well, in talking of the identity of the church, what about its worship? Uh, oh, uh, John 4, verse 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, friends, I want us to notice that statement. Uh, you've heard it a thousand times, I'm sure, but listen to what it's actually saying. God is a spirit, and they who worship Him, M-U-S-T. Uh, there's no option. Uh, here's the way it is done. Must worship with a right attitude of reverence, awe, and respect in full recognition of our total dependence upon Him. You remember James 1, verse 17? Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variation, neither shadow that is cast by turning. What is he saying? Oh, I breathe his air, I drink his water, I eat his food, I wear his clothing, I walk on his footstool, I dwell literally in the hollow of his hand. I am totally dependent upon God. Oh, God is a spirit right? And they that worship Him must worship in spirit, right? Attitude of reverence and awe, and there is no greater privilege than to assemble with others of like precious faith in the divine presence for the purpose of adoring, paying homage to Him who is the giver of every good and perfect gift, who through the sacrificial death of His Son has made available to a reprobate a sinner such as I, the hope of eternal life, there is no greater privilege. Well, what are we going to do when we come together, and we are to come together, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the custom of some is, Hebrews 10, verse 25. So we are to come together uh, when, upon the first day of the week, Acts 20 at verse 7, and uh, for the purpose of worshiping God. What a tremendous, unequaled privilege and opportunity, coming together to worship God. Well, what is to be done in worshiping God <clears throat> in spirit and in truth, which of course is a must, as Jesus tells us, what are we to do? Oh, what has He said about it? <clears throat> you see, we come together to observe the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. You remember the Lord instituted the Supper in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. You remember he blessed the bread and break it. 
he told his disciples to eat. Ah, this is my body, which is given, uh, broken uh, for many. It's uh, sacrificed uh, for the salvation of the souls of men. So when we come together on the first day of the week, we have unleavened bread, which is the only kind of bread they had at uh, the Passover, you remember. So we have unleavened bread. And when you break that bread and take that bite, remember, you are showing forth the Lord's death and suffering until He comes again. You are commemorating the death of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what Paul said? The cup which we bless? Oh, friend, it is a commemoration of the blood of Christ. Uh, the bread uh, which we bless, uh, is it not a commemoration of the body of Christ? Uh, why, certainly. That's what the Lord's Supper uh, is all about. It is a memorial uh, feast. Now, uh, the Lord's Supper <coughs> is not provided to satisfy physical appetite. Why, certainly not. It is a commemoration. It is a memorial of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. Uh, that's why Paul said over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 at verse 20, when you come together, it's not possible to eat the Lord's Supper. Wait, wait, wait. What are you saying, Paul? When we come together, that's when we are to eat the Lord's Supper. Acts 20 verse 7, right. But now the circumstances is what he's dealing with. Listen to him. When you come together, he said to the church at Corinth, it's not possible to eat the Lord's Supper. For one taketh before the other, his, one is hungry, another is drunken. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What have they done with the Lord's Supper? They have made of it a common meal. They are eating to satisfy fleshly appetite. They are drinking, for some one is drunken and another is gluttonous. And, well, friend, you can't take the Lord's Supper. That, that's sinful. That's ungodly. You, you can't. No, no. The Lord's Supper is not a physical feast to satisfy bodily appetite. That's not the idea at all. It is to commemorate the death burial, and resurrection of the Son of God. We do that every first day of the week. And you know, I remember when the Lord took the cup and, and blessed it, He told His disciples, drink ye all of it. Each of us is to sip of the fruit of the vine. Oh, and He said in verse 29, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Oh, that's when he instituted the Lord's Supper, Matthew 26 at verse 29. We need to understand that. When I lift that little cup to my lips, just to take a sip of that grape juice, it can be fermented or unfermented. That's not important one way or the other. Oh, but it is the fruit of the vine. That's important indeed. That's specified. I need to remember that Christ is there. It is a marvelous privilege an unexcelled blessing for Christian people to be able to assemble in a free land in the divine presence for the purpose of worship. And then when we observe the Lord's Supper, as somebody says, now on what day? Oh, Acts 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, ah, Paul preached unto them. And that's generally what we do when we come together upon the first day of the week. And we always observe the Lord's Supper. Uh, that's uh, why we come together. But <clears throat> more than that, uh, worshiping God in spirit and in truth, as we said, is simply doing what He said. No more and no less. It is imperative. Must worship in spirit and in truth. So when we come together, we lift our voices in song. We sing, uh, speaking one to another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto God, Ephesians 5 at verse 19. That's a great privilege indeed. Uh, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto God, Ephesians 5, 19, singing, making melody with your hearts unto God. Oh, but the point is, uh, when the church comes together, we sing. We teach and admonish, encourage uh, one another. Right. Did you know that today 
uh, most uh, denominations, most religious institutions uh, that are not, of course, mentioned in the Scripture, uh, use mechanical instruments of music in worship. Well, someone says, preacher, well, what would be wrong with that? I mean, you know, I, I like the sound of a, of a mechanical instrument when we're singing. What are you talking about? That has nothing to do with the worship of God. What I like or dislike doesn't enter the picture at all. No, no. <clears throat> God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Oh, what did He say about making music? <clears throat> he said, sing. Make melody with your heart. Uh, thereby you teach and admonish one another. You can't do any of that with a mechanical instrument of music. It doesn't work that way. It, well, yes, but somebody says, preacher, it just enhances the, not really, not really. It doesn't enhance it at all. But that's beside the point. Even if it did, you still couldn't use it. Why? God said, sing. You can't add to or delete from, nor may you substitute for God's divine revelation. Friend, that's taught time and time and time again in the Old Testament, isn't it? Leviticus chapter 10, Nadab and Abihu, verses 1 and 2, sons of Aaron, they were priests. Uh, their task was to burn incense before the Lord, and they each took a censer, put incense thereon, and offered strange fire, which Jehovah commanded not. And fire came forth from the Lord, burned them to death. Well, uh, just a minute. Why? Oh, they offered strange fire, which Jehovah commanded not. Well, someone asked, where did God tell Nadab and Abihu not to use strange fire? He didn't mention it at all. He didn't say anything about it. That's the first time it's mentioned right there. Well, why did He slay them? Because they offered strange fire, which Jehovah commanded not not. Friend, you can't add to God's Word. No, sir, thou shalt not add unto the words which I speak unto thee this day, ah, that thou mayest keep all the commandments of Jehovah thy God. Uh, that's Deuteronomy 4 at verse 2, you remember. Uh, Proverbs 30 verses 5 and 6, every word of God is tried. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His word, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Oh, we can't do that. Uh, Revelation 22, last chapter in the Bible, verses 18 and 19. Thou shalt not add unto these words. What's that? I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the book of this prophecy. If any man shall take away from the words of this book, God will take away his part from the tree of life. If any man shall add to the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. We can't add to, delete from, or substitute for God's instruction. What did God say about making music and worship? He said, sing. Well, He didn't say, don't. Yeah, that's uh, the problem with denominationalism. If we can do whatever the Lord has not forbidden, no say, no say. Faith cometh of hearing, hearing not but what God didn't say. No, no. Faith cometh of hearing, hearing but the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. Oh, and God is a spirit, and they that worship Him, M-U-S-T, must do it like He said. That's the only thing God respects is His will. So we must do only that which God has authorized. To use mechanical instruments of music and the Word of God and the worship of God is sin. And uh, for it, man, of course, will pay the price. The wages of sin is death, in Romans 6, verse 23. And so I need to make up my heart and mind that I'm going to walk by faith. Oh, faith cometh of hearing and hearing, not by what the Lord didn't say. No, no. Faith cometh of hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So I need to order my life by a thus saith the Lord. So when the church comes together in worship, we observe the Lord's Supper. We commune with Jesus Christ. We show forth His death and suffering till He shall come again. And that will endure till the end of time. Now, we need the right attitude. I need to understand that this is a memorial feast. I need to understand the solemnity and the great privilege of assembly and worship. It is wonderful. And then we sing, thus teaching and admonishing one another and lifting up our very hearts and souls in rejoicing before Him who provided through the death of His Son for the salvation of our souls. 
What else should we do when we come together for the purpose of worship? <clears throat> oh, we pray. Prayer is vital. I remember 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Uh, pray without ceasing. What's he saying? Be in prayer? No, 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 no. Pray continually. Remember your total dependence upon God. In everything, give thanks. Realize that every blessing is from the hand of God. So we pray. When we come together, we pray. Paul said, you remember, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, I desire that men pray in every place, lifting up holy hands without wrath and disputing. So when we come together, we unite our hearts in prayer. Now, as he pointed out, things are to be done decently and in order. And so one man leads the prayer audibly, and we hear what he is saying in agreement therewith, if that prayer is in harmony with the Lord's will, we say, Amen. So would it be. Let it be uh, that way. So prayer is an important part of the worship of God. The assembly of the saints are engaged therein. He taught them, taught them a parable to the end that they ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke 18 at verse 1. Since God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, uh, James 1, 17, since I do totally depend upon Him for all of the blessings of life, and since I am a child of God when I am in the household of God, the church, Ephesians 2, verse 19, oh, then I need to talk to Him. He's my Father. Uh, that's the concept the Lord is teaching, isn't it? When He put that little child in the midst of His disciples, in Matthew 18, verse 3, he said, Except you be converted and become as this little child, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying about a little child that should characterize a grown man? Oh, total dependence upon God. Just as when I was a child, I depended upon my father. He provided for my physical necessities. I didn't worry about making a living for a family. I didn't have a family. Oh, sure, I had a family. I had a mother and father and three sisters and a brother, uh, but it was not my responsibility uh, to provide for their physical welfare. Oh, that was my father's responsibility, and I depended upon him, trusted. That's it exactly. God is our heavenly Father. I am His child. Uh, that's why Paul pointed out, of course, in Philippians 4 at verse 6, in nothing be anxious. But you say, don't worry. No, no. We're the children of God. Everything I need, He provides. Uh, through prayer and thanksgiving, He makes available to me that which is needed. So when the church comes together, we pray. Also, when we come together, we teach and admonish one another. We preach God's Word. It is so important, uh, vital uh, for the continuity of spiritual life. This is food uh, for the soul. So when we come together, we teach God's Word. So the, the worship of God is really very simple, and it's outlined in Scripture, and we can't add to it or delete from it. As a matter of fact, I say that so frequently. A person who is committed to God through Jesus Christ, who believes in the salvation made available by the sacrificial death and subsequent resurrection of God's Son, doesn't want to add to it for well, the very idea. He doesn't want to change the worship. One of the problems in our world today, and sometimes even in the Lord's church, is that we're not walking with Christ. Uh, we have forgotten that commitment that we made uh, to the Lord. Uh, we've decided we want something uh, uh, entertaining. You know, that's always been true, even of God's people. Why well, in the Old Testament, read it. The descendants of Abraham, the chosen people of God, how long did they remain faithful to the Lord? <laughs> Not very long. Now, I had a faithful leader. Generally, the people were faithful. Uh, Joshua, the people were faithful during his tenure. Oh, and even in the lives of the elders who outlived Joshua. After that, gone again. Uh, one generation may be faithful. Next generation, uh, Samuel, the last of the 15 judges, the first of the oral prophets. His sons, reprobates. Reprobates. Eli, high priest, one of the judges, oh, his sons, reprobates. It is amazing. Somebody says, well, that's a failure of father. That is a failure of family. That, 
sure it could very well be, and may uh, very well be. But the fact is, men do not for very long remain faithful to the Lord. We're going to do it our way. No, not go to heaven you aren't. The only way we're going to heaven is to do it God's way. So when the church comes together, and that is important, ah, friends, we observe the Lord's Supper. We sing, thus teaching and admonishing one another. Oh, and we teach God's Word, and then we have the privilege of giving of our means. Upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him, him in store as God hath prospered him. Ah, 1 Corinthians 16 at verse 2. So very important, the worship of God. What a joy it has been to spend this time with you in your home. We would love to hear from you. Why not visit our website at preachingthegospeltv.com and while you're there, sign the guest book so we may know who's viewing this program around the nation. If you would like a free cassette tape of this program, just pick up the phone and call us at 1-800-683-3120 or write to us at P.O. Box 1484, Dalton, Georgia, 30722. Our email address is ptgwjw at aol.com. When you are requesting a tape, please include the program number you see on your screen. Maybe you want to study more about God's Word. If so, we can send you the first lesson in this eight-lesson series free of charge. These lessons are intended to help you gain a better understanding of God's Word. Your friends in the Churches of Christ have brought you this program today, and they would love to have you come and visit their services. If you need assistance in finding a congregation in your area, we would be glad to help you. Preaching the Gospel is under the oversight of the elders of the Highland Church of Christ in Dalton, Georgia. And now, back to my dad. Uh, worship is not a matter that satisfies me. We do not come together on the first day of the week so that I can be satisfied, so that we do things that please. No, 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 no. We come together to worship God. How may we worship God? I have to listen to what he said about the worship that he accepts. I do only that which he authorizes uh, in daily life. And certainly, when we come together for the purpose of worship, it is imperative. We must worship in spirit and in truth. So it's simply a matter of complying with the Lord's instruction. And it is a great blessing and privilege so to do. And you know the good thing about the Lord's instruction is that it doesn't leave me up in the air. I don't have to institute this or decide on that or I'm going He's already stated it. He gives me instruction. Here's the way I do it. And a simple person like me needs that kind of guidance. May God help us in worshiping.